Yes, sir. Welcome to another episode of the 116 Life right here on Holy Culture Radio, Sirius XM Channel 140. Listen, let's start the year off with some affirmations. For we sure. love you. Let's go ahead and start right there. I we love it. you. Thank y'all so much for, for tuning sure. in once again. As y'all know, it's a new year, but we got the same. I got my same co-host with me. I got Ace Harris right here. What's How up? you feeling, Ace? I'm good. I'm good. Just ready to get to 2024. You know, you, sometimes you reset and you like do these like resolutions and all that stuff yeah are you a resolutions person um, i'm more of a run the day and that makes a great year no so i just try to manage my days you know what i'm saying but listen i feel like we got to go ahead and start this show with our special guest for sure you know i feel like he's an amazing story well he i'm not not, i feel like he is an amazing storyteller filmmaker writer and we got him here on the 116 life welcome rich perez to the show what up what up what up what up rich how you you feeling man an incredible radio voice yo like me is the truth. Yeah, <laughs> you and one. Thank you, you girl. Man. Thank you, bro. You got an that means a lot. Voice. Listen, we're so happy to have you, man. I really mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, happy New Year. What What are you most excited for for twenty twenty four? Oh gosh, so much. I think. Uh, well, Happy New Year to both of y'all. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really, really thankful to be here. There's a lot to be excited. I'm here. You know, I'm here. I've got my family healthy. Uh, we're in a new season of life. Uh, you know, being able to enjoy parenting with my teenager. Mm. I think I'm excited about family. I I I deeply love my unit. I mm. love my tribe. Uh, that's what we call ourselves on, on the group chat. Mm. Um, and I think that there is something deeply special about getting to parent my teen. Um, so I'm excited about that in 2024. Mm. Just a new season of parenting. He's a sophomore in high school, helping him think about his future, his present, uh, but also some really dope creative endeavors. Uh, yeah, I'm excited that's about. super dope, man. I feel like I feel like I've definitely like known you for about three or four years, but like I that. feel like definitely every time I meet you, man, it's always pleasant. You always kill. You're always fresh. Always. For those, for those who can't, I know we're on the radio right now, but when you get to, when you guys get the YouTube link, you got to check it out. I yeah, mean, for sure. I appreciate the kids. It, but so speaking of that, like you're someone who's very <clears> much into like. You're hit, you're cut from hip hop. I feel like you're New York, fashionable. You're fresh. You're a man of faith. How does it feel? Because I saw a clip from Will Smith um, talking with his son about the Watch the Throne album, and like mm. this, this is marriage of like when millennial dads, not not to ages, but like when fatherhood and sons who like are into culture, into hip hop, can yeah. find this meeting space. How does it feel to like be someone who is like into fashion, into faith, into hip hop, have a teenage son? How does it feel relating to him versus like when you were probably growing up? Oh, it feels fantastic because, you know, we say this all the time about parenting. One of the things that perhaps our parents didn't do as well for one reason or another was determine when they had to start fading in friendship into the, the, the friendship dynamic into relationship of parenting because I have a dad now who I love, um, has done incredible things to impact me in the way that I live today, but he didn't really know, nor did he have the tools to figure out that at some point he was gonna have to be my friend. Mm. Cause he wasn't gonna always have to parent me. You know, like he'll call me now and we'll talk and he'll try to do parenting things. I'm like, dad, I'm, I'm 40. Like you don't gotta, <laughs> you don't gotta parent me dog. Like mm-hmm. we could just talk baseball. We could just talk casually and be friends. And so I say that to say, I get excited about this particular season of parenting. You know, you talk about hip hop. I love music, not just hip hop, but really music sure, in general. Sure, yeah. Like not, not the type. No, 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 not, not at all. I mean, I am from New York. Yeah. I, I do kinda, love hip hop. Everybody from New York can literally play basketball and rap. It's just kind of, <laughs> It's just part of the. It comes with it. It comes with the tips and the you know the bacon and cheese. It's the starter kit for all New York City babies. But you know, like into into music, into fashion, into culture, into you know pop culture in particular, like all things that my son really enjoys. I get the opportunity to use those things at this stage of his life as a 15 year old to say, "Let me fade in some friendship dynamics here because I know the time will come, perhaps sooner than later." where I won't need to parent him and then right. I won't have anything to relate with him on because he won't need my direction mm. in the way that he did when he was seven or 10 or 13. Um, so I use things like hip hop. I use things like sports. I use things like uh, pop culture as a medium to build deeper connection with my son 
which will in turn give birth to a really dope friendship that, uh, you know, we're not just raising kids, we're raising friends in mm. some ways. So that's I amazing. Think, um, that's so that's real. Exciting. Only yeah. because um, you just, that that relationship, that parent-child uh, relationship is so important. You know what I'm saying? Because once they get older, I remember my dad told me on Father's Day, he was like, I'm no longer your dad. I was like, well, <laughs> well what, what are we celebrating here? But it's the fact that he he raised me to a point. So that's now right. that like, you know, we're able to bond on different things. So th that's so important that you yeah. see it. Uh, long haul, you know what I'm saying? You see it like, you know, four, four years, like years ahead of where you want to be with yourself. Well, you know, my wife said something recently. Um, so I'll say this and we can tap into this later if y'all see that. Sure. It's oh, important. No, it's all you. My wife and, my, my wife and I uh, just started recording a podcast where we talk a, a lot about our parenting experiences, but also our marital experiences. Um, and one of the things that she said recently was, I wish we had a better philosophy of change. And what she would go on to describe is something that you just mentioned, Mia, like we don't know how to view ourselves as ever evolving people mm, that's right. that different seasons of life will um, cause us to change in certain ways and thus change the way that we relate to the world, including the, the relationships that we have. And I think your dad saying, yo, I'm no longer your father, mm -hmm. wasn't him saying, I'm not your father. Mm -hmm. What he's saying in, in many ways is there's a new way that you can relate to mm -hmm. me now as, which mm -hmm. is friend. Right. Like, you don't need me to do the things that necessarily a father uh, does for a child when they're young and incredibly dependent. Now, I'm the father that feels more like a friend who serves as a sage Sage, wise sure. friend older for sure but still a friend and i think that that is the season that my wife and i are in now realizing that with this philosophy of change we won't always be needed by our kids the way that they need us now so we have to figure out a way to relate to them outside of what they need from us. That's amazing. So it's it's exciting to hear what you're saying about your dad because I feel like that's where we're at right now. Yeah, I feel like, listen, let us know when the book comes out, <laughs> bitch, at this point because you're dropping gems in the podcast here. But listen, you you said something that I thought was so important, which we can go ahead and dive into your, your, your filmmaking and your creative storytelling because you talked about being uh, submerged in culture and like, you know, being from New York, loving music. I want to know, when, when did your passion for storytelling start, like, kick off for you? Oh my gosh. So... I think uh, there's this philosopher that says life is lived forward, but understood backward. Mm. Um, and mm. and and I'm, I say that to say I had to pause. I had to just had nah, to, I, for I, real. I, I, yeah. Let that sit that sit just for a little bit, my G. I had to, that's that's great. That's super that's great. Soren Kierkegaard is the one who said it. He said life is lived forward, but understood backward. And you asking me this question, I probably would have answered it very differently a few years ago. <clears throat> but being in Atlanta for the last three years, three years removed from being a pastor for almost two decades, I realized that these three years in Atlanta gave me a lot of time for reflection in order to give the best answer to this, or at least the answer that I think is best. I feel as though storytelling has been woven into everything that I've done since a child even while I was pastoring, even while I was working in nonprofit, even while I was traveling and doing music and uh, theater. I think for me, if I, could, if I can identify a significant moment, maybe not the first moment, but a significant moment was uh, when I was about 19, when mm -hmm. I joined this group called Truce, uh, where I met uh, Andy, Mm. Uh, and my buddy Alex Medina, who I'd been friends with at that point for about a decade, mm. he and I joined this group where we did, we were a traveling music and theater group. What? Whoa. So, Yo. So, do we got to dive, no, we gotta dive in that one. That sounds so, because I'm not going to lie, you said truth, I thought you were going to say rap group. Yeah, I, I was group definitely or something. Him. <clears throat> But I was you, but I, I've no. never, but so I'm talk about that. Andy ain't talking about so you said, Andy, Andy likes to keep some of the sea lights okay, stuff okay. under wraps. And we gonna, this we was gonna, even we before sea light. Oh, we're going to pull it all out. I mean, every now and then a group in the group chat, a little, a little throwback <laughs> picture comes up. And Andy's just like, yo, don't ever put this out into the world. <laughs> uh, but yeah, continue. So, you know, uh, Alex Medina and I were at City College in New York. Alex was studying music. I was studying film. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And in our junior, well, I was a senior. Uh, Alex was a junior. Andy was a freshman. We met Andy. We joined this group through a brother named David Ham, who actually used to be Andy's old manager. I mean, this was a long time ago. Wow. I mean, I was 18, 19. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be 40 next month. So this was a while back. And so we joined this group and we essentially did uh, hip hop and theater, uh, street mm -hmm. theater. And so we would go to, you know, the toughest inner cities of both this country and internationally. I remember we went to uh, Reading, Washington. We went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Of course, all the parts of New York City. We went to London and spent about a month and a half there doing you went to music. London? Yeah, we went to London. Who was finding? Like, what, what, what? So the uh, so truth. <laughs> yo, y'all so <laughs> Y'all had the investment bag, no, yo. Y'all yo, we like, went London. around the city. Y'all went funny, around campus. Y'all went around the world, basically. And so we this was essentially a offshoot ministry of Nikki Cruz outreach. Nikki Cruz was a 1950 New York City gang leader. Turned Christian by David Wilkerson, nice, yeah, presented okay. the gospel mm -hmm. to him. He radically Whoa. changed his they, life. As in Rich Wilkerson's uh, Well, I don't know if Rich Wilkerson is related okay, to him. Okay, 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 okay. David okay. Wilkerson okay. started Times Square Church in New York. Okay, gotcha, okay. okay. Long story, uh, Nikki Cruz started Teen Challenge, which is a rehabilitation center for ex-gang members. Right. And then he started many decades later this music group that David Hamm became the executive director. And it's essentially a group of like, it was essentially like a group of 13 to 15 te New York City teenagers that were musicians, mm -hmm. rappers, and actors. And we essentially made music, wrote our own uh, uh, screenplays, and did theater on the street. And we mm -hmm. the biggest project we did was in London for about a month and a half where we lived out there and we did street theater in what they called estates at that time in East London, which is kind of like our projects. Mm. Gotcha. And we would set up a fake floor, a crazy sound system. This is amazing. And we, yeah, Alex yeah. would essentially play his beats, me, Andy, and this brother named Keith, you know, Lord rest his soul, uh, would just freestyle until we gathered a crowd and then when the crowd gathered, you know, I mean, sometimes it was like 500 people just gathered in the oh. streets. Uh, we would do like three of our original songs. And then at the very end, one of us would present the gospel wow. and invite people to faith. Wow. Yeah. And we did that. I did that from the time I was eight, 19 to 26. So Yo. we did that for a couple years and it was probably the most formative time of my life and perhaps the time wow. that most shaped in me my love for proclamation sure. and theater mm. like the the artistic expression of proclamation which is what would ultimately influence my love for preaching teaching but I always understood my preaching and teaching as a form of storytelling. That's good. Uh, as a form of theater. I think that theater is really important to proclamation. Yeah. So Some people have a wrestle with that word. Ain't gonna lie. When you was talking about the truth group, I, I man, all, all I could think of was Sister Act Two. You know what I'm saying? Like the <laughs> Oh, Sister Act Two. <laughs> I but no, it. but but I I think that is just like or like a Mickey Mouse Club type type joke. Uh, a, a little cooler though. Look, Sister Act Two was a lot kinda, cooler. Sister, Sister Act Two yeah, was yeah. kind of a vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was, was out it there. Was. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. Saying? It was I like agree. colorful yeah. and youthful. But I just feel like that's so that's so unique. It says so much about you. I, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm understanding you in real time. Like, mm. oh, this makes sense. This is who mm. Rich is. Mm -hmm. He, you was out here pro proclaiming the gospel in theater and art and hip hop literally all around the world, which informs so many things about what oh, you're doing so now. Much. You know what I'm saying? So much, dog. That's super yeah, good. yeah. It was, uh, it was one of the most formative times of my life, for sure. I would love to, on the next segment, just get back into what went on next in your life. Because I sure. feel like, you know, you going, getting into pastoring and, and it seems like the last 20 years has been a different route in terms of how you proclaimed and how yeah, you lived that absolutely. out. But definitely, let's definitely stay right back on the 116 Life Holy Culture Radio Series Channel 140. I got the amazing, the incredible, the fashionable, the faithful Rich Perez in the building. Mia, how you feeling? Listen, I'm feeling good. We're going to dive more into Rich's life right here on the 116 Life. We'll be right back.
And we're back right here on the 116 Live here on Holy Culture Radio, Sirius XM, Channel 140. I got my co-host here, Ace Harris, and we have our special guest, Rich Perez, here. Listen, we're talking about a lot of things. We're talking about truce. Now, we were talking off camera. We're talking about how we kind of want to go into how truce, uh, where things went for you after that. So after that, um, that part of your life happened, like, where did you go? Like, what, what did you go into? I know you went into ministry after. Does that happen right after Truce? It does. So actually, it, there's a lot of overlap, a few years of overlap. Mm -hmm. So I joined that group when I was 18. Uh, I got married uh, when I was 23 in 2007. And my wife and I immediately moved to upstate New York to Bible school to be there for three years. So from the time that I was 23 to the time that I was about 26, I was still doing truce mm -hmm. whenever they did shows near me, mm -hmm. and whenever I could travel. Mm -hmm. I mean, we also had a baby. So I started as the older statesman of the group, started to kind of peel off a little bit. But we moved upstate New York because we knew we wanted to go to Bible school because ultimately I wanted to plant a church. And that came from, as I mentioned, my love for theater, my love for... It's so funny talking about what made you want to go into pastoral ministry. Yeah. What was your call? And I say, I loved theater and I loved so proclamation because oftentimes people talk about the call to, pa to the pastorate like this mythical thing, like a, a word dropped into your soul. And that does kind of play a part in it. But it was also really practical for me. Like gotcha. I loved... Being a leader, I was I was a, I played college basketball, so I was also kind of like a floor general. The idea of leadership w w came very natural to mm -hmm. me. Uh, I was also doing hip hop and leading in this group, being in front of people. So my love for like hip hop, proclamation, being a basketball player, um, my love for innovation, mm -hmm. my love for novelty, my love for theater, <clears throat> all of that actually fed my love for pastoring mm. um because i saw so much of pastoring as all of those things yeah. sure and so i did that for three years my wife and i came back in 2009 2010 and we started the church um and we led that church for about 10 years uh up until 2020 when we transitioned here to new york to atlanta but those years in in church planning and in pastoring I I um I used so many of the skills mm -hmm. that being in those moments of leadership with truth and again my love for creativity my love for novelty I felt as though I loved what my immigrant church did for me spiritually I grew love up in that. a in a Spanish speaking immigrant church in the heart of Washington Heights which is northern Manhattan New York City where Alex and I were spiritually shaped mm. uh, I loved everything they did for me but I think that they were talking to my parents more than they were to me. I think that they were talking to the immigrant and I wasn't an immigrant. Sure. I was first only, generation. Yeah, yeah. I was first generation here. Mm. And while I, Spanish is my first language, I feel very connected to my parents' culture and my culture. I felt as though that I also owed a kind of debt to my culture being from in, inner city New mm. York Spanglish. I can see all. I can see all the uh, the uh, the patriarchs and matriarchs of your family just rolling their eyes now. Yeah. I, can, I, I can relate a little bit because I'm I'm first generation American. Right. My dad's a pet. My dad um, was a pastor, and I'm you know from from Liberia. So I grew up in a church that he planted That's that right. was like 90 percent African and like eighty five percent Liberian. So it was like that was the culture that was, was right. woven in. So like to you, I think it was like you you grow up in this church and you love the Lord, you love what you're being taught and fed. And I sh shout out ICF Ministries, love y'all, still give, still support, y'all amazing. Yeah, but I yeah. also think there is needs to be a conversation about how can first generation um you know people find their own culture without abandoning the culture of the well, past. Well, I you just, know? that's really well said. I think that so much of what I was learning about my son, and again, uh -huh. life is lived forward but understood backwards. Part of what, I, what I'm realizing now is that I represented a hybrid culture, a, sure. a, a, a kind of person that existed between these two worlds. And I thought that I needed to be either part of this world or that world. But what I realized later was, oh no, the middle is my world. And I could create a language here and I could create, a, I could discover a language here. I could discover ethics here that honor both of these places, both my immigrant culture and also my new culture of yeah. like inner city New sure. York world. 
I needed to find a way to bring those together and create a language. And that's where the church came because I said, I love what my immigrant church did, but they don't really understand the culture of the middle. Mm. Um, they only understand the immigrant culture. And our church was for the culture of the middle. It spoke the language, or at least we endeavored to speak the language, understand the challenges, understand sure. the rhythms. And we were a church of hybrid people, you know, That's whether amazing. we were mostly Dominican American, Caribbean American, African American, Asian American, we were mostly Hispanic American, but it was the culture of the middle. And we did that for, you know, 10 years and it was all parts exi exciting and exhausting, <laughs> exhilarating and traumatizing. Like it was, it was equal parts to all of those yeah. things. Yeah. And do you feel like that experience like made you the whole or the pursuing whole person that you are now? Like, I mean, sometimes people look, you say life is lived for and it's uh, understood, understood backwards. backwards. I, I think it's tough for us to live in the past, but talk about how that 10 year journey has just shaped the kind of man you are now to, you know, like you probably, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't want to speak for you, but you wouldn't take it away or trade it. I mean, no, you? not at all. I, somebody recently asked me in another podcast, like what I felt about those 10 years, uh, because in 2020, I made the decision with my wife to leave. I wasn't removed because of sin. I wasn't, uh. you know, removed because of bad stewardship or leadership. I made a conscious decision along with my wife, prayerful decision in a good season to leave. Right. And I think that that context is really important. Right. So that sure. it's not misunderstood. Sure. But all that to say, I said to the person, I said, I loved every second of pastoring. Like I, I knew while I was doing it, that that's what I was supposed to be doing. That's amazing. Um, and so much of those 10 years, how did they shape me? Gosh, I mean, huh. They made me a better listener, you know, like I feel that leaders think that their main responsibility is to lead with communication. And I think that that's a part of it. But I realize that leadership requires, first and foremost, really good listening, because otherwise you don't have nothing to say if you don't if you don't listen well to the story of the people that you're trying to lead. And man, you know, I was really challenged. Mm. Like, I think that the people, as I tried to listen to them and lead them, they showed me a lot of myself. You know, the, the congregation showed me a lot of myself, perhaps as much as they think or believe that I showed them a mm. lot as the leader. And um, they made me a softer, those 10 years made me a softer person. Because it, it made me realize how complex we are as people. For sure. And also how much burden we yeah. all carry, hidden burden. Yes. Yeah. Um, that you either worked really hard to hide or that you are totally unaware that you carry because of sure. a lack of tools and awareness. And I think having to navigate people through that through shepherding and teaching and listening and counseling and meeting with this person here meeting with that person there meeting with this group here thinking about what they need to hear me preach thinking about what they need to hear me lead i just became an incredibly empathic person uh, because life is hard people are complex and we need to be kind in our leadership you know <laughs> so like good, it's just man. It's so, so, so good. Especially the listening part. Like you, that, was, that was so key. I grew up in a, um, a mega church. So I wasn't, there was like, and also even like with my youth ministry I was a part of, there were like thousands of other, you know, yeah, youth and things yeah. like that. So nothing against anything like that, but sometimes you can get a chance to get lost. It's a challenge. And so um, now I'm in a church that's more local and like the pastor, like the pastor going out, talking to people, asking me, like looking me in my eye, asking me how I'm doing, like, Things like that, like the listening part, you said sure. that, that just really resonated with me because I feel like it's so important to listen to people. And pastors are the carry such important roles and even heavy roles because y'all connect to people. You know what I'm saying? So the the role of listening, something as simple as listening is so important. So I'm happy that you spoke to that. Um, so I'm curious to what that transition was like for you transitioning from 10 years of ministry into then going into like, you know, the storytelling and filmmaking. What was, what was that like for you? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. If, first and foremost, mm -hmm. because 
I was leaving something that I loved. Mm. I loved pastoring. I loved shepherding. I mean, there were aspects about sure. being a pastor that I didn't enjoy. Um, but I loved being in that role. And so it was difficult making the decision to transition out of that. However, I have an incredibly supportive tribe, mm. both in my family, but also my, my, my friends who I consider family. Uh, and also just my family as well. Um, everyone was very supportive. <clears throat> everyone was very eager to help me process the sure. transition, which I think was really key because left to myself, I wouldn't have had perspective about what I was doing. But aside from it being difficult, leaving something that I love, it was also exciting. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I can kind of just see that. Mm. I yeah. see that energy around mm. you when I've come around you. It's like, I mean, similarly to one of our good friends, John, I mean, you, you guys are, you know, pastors for so many years. During our young, young years, yeah. too. But I see, see like a new era for both of y'all. That's mm -hmm. like, it gives me life. It's like yeah, these dudes for sure. are invigorated and ex excited mm. to use what God has given them. And I also, I think it also releases some of the pressure of Christian culture in America about like, yo, to, to serve the Lord is to do this for life in this 100%. capacity. 100%. It's like, fam, nah. Well, <laughs> you know, you know John, yeah. John actually has um, a really good metaphor that he's come across in his own reflection and reading. But if, if pastoring, it, the success of pastoring is reaching the top of the mountain, we make the mistake of putting all of our energy hmm. into this role, into this call um, to get to the top, but we leave no energy to come back down. And so to your point, mm, what good. I realized in 2020 was we did a good thing. The Lord used us to do a good thing for 10 years. I need to leave some energy to come back down. Because the people that will feel it the most if you don't leave energy is who? Your wife and your kids. That's good. That's good. Your kids will be like, oh, you gave all your energy to the church. Oh, okay, I see. But I, I, my wife and I decided I was going to leave energy for the second half of life That's so that great. I could be with my kids in a more intentional way. I thought I did that well while I was passing, but now I'm like, I'm you in. all yeah. in. I'm, I'm helping myself to think about what it means to love my kids in this season of life. I'm, I'm all in into helping my son think about his teenage years, think about college in two years. Like, I have time to do that. I don't have a meeting to go to. I don't have a leadership meeting. I don't have a counseling session. I don't have to prepare for a sermon. Like, all great things, but that season is done. So yeah. I was also very excited mm. about the transition and, and what it was going to afford me. Now, transitioning into this new vocation of filmmaking, yeah. I was incredibly excited about that because that's what I studied in, in college. And I thought that that's what I was going to be doing yeah. after college. And, you know, the Lord took me in a different direction. But I'm so glad that I did, that I entered into filmmaking now. Why, why is that? I have life. I've lived life. So good. My bro. stories have greater depth. I'm not a tw and and this is not this is not an absolute by any means. Sure. But I'm not a 21 year old kid trying to break into the film industry. Oh wow, yeah. I'm a 40 year old man who has life experiences and has two decades of storytelling um, that yeah. I'm now bringing into my work. So when people, if you know, I do a lot of freelance work. So whether I get hired to do a documentary or to do just a simple brand video. I'm coming, what, I think what I bring that's most valuable is my taste. It's, it's my taste and my life experiences because I'm not just going to help you sell these shoes or I'm not just going to help you sell this item. I'm going to help you sell yourself. Yeah. And to identify yourself, mm -hmm. to identify your client's self, you have to know who you are. You have to actually be good at the skills of tearing the layers apart of the false self so that you can actually sell the product that you need to sell. And so hmm. I'm really excited about this season of, of filmmaking because I want to tell stories that are true of my experience. I want to tell stories that are um, deep, honest, and complex hmm. so that they reflect 
our reality. And and um, I also just love good storytelling, you know, uh, visual storytelling. So all that to say, my transition was hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a little fear inducing because you don't know how mm -hmm. next is going to look. Uh, but it was also exciting because I was going to jump into something that I really loved. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to jump into the next segment, uh, one of your short films that I had the pleasure of seeing. And I, uh, I'm before I even say what oh, I got to say. It. Thank yeah, you. right. So oh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be able to dive more into that in this next segment. We'll be right back here on the 116 Live here on Holy Culture Radio, Sirius XM on Channel 140. We'll be right back. And we're back right here on the 116 Live here on Holy Culture Radio, Sirius XM, Channel 140. Listen, we're going to wrap up this final segment. Rich, I got to tell you this. You inspire me, man. I mean that wholeheartedly. I grew up in a, um, uh, I grew up with a writing background and mm. I went to a performing arts uh, high school oh, and sure. uh, writing was my minor in uh, drama was my major and I thought that I, I wanted I had aspirations to go into film and things like that so even get, getting the chance to see your um, short film It Stays With Us was so inspiring to mm -hmm. me and even like hearing you talk you know talk about um, how creatives like you are just so important only because you you care you know what I'm saying like, like how you said the there there are bits of you whether it's a, a brand deal or something that's very like you know an intricate story you you put your pieces your taste into it and it it tells something bigger than what people think so mm. I'm so grateful that you're here and people are able to hear your story um I want to talk about it stays with us your short film so what what inspired you to make that film tell that particular story that you did with that uh, short film well, thank you for sharing that. That means a lot to me, Mia, seriously. Um, <clears throat> you know, grief is universal. The, the movie is about grief. Um, but particularly, it was inspired by, by my mom who passed away in 2007 and my younger brother who was 15 when she passed away. Um, I don't think I've ever said this out loud anywhere but it was inspired by my brother mm -hmm. because I was married when my when my mom passed away and my older sister was married with children mm -hmm. my brother was left with my father um and he had to process that grief alone because I had moved away and my sister lived in Jersey also but the movie is essentially about wrestling with the question <clears throat> what can it look like if we gave young black and brown boys the permission to feel sorrow? Like, what does it look like? Hmm. Um, and that was a really important story for me to tell. One, because it was personal to me and the loss that I was experiencing. But particularly to show the complexity of how human emotions, especially the emotion of sadness, is not well received when a young black boy feels it, right? Mm. Because black and brown boys should learn to master anger, not sadness, mm. you know? And um, mm. I wanted to show what it looks like for a young brown boy to like wrestle with his grief even years after the loss. That's another aspect of the film, right? That grief, as our good friend John would say, doesn't expire. It's not something that ends but rather something that lingers or something that stays with us. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn to sure. relate to it differently. So the, the movie was really, the message of the movie and the telling of this story was really important. Another really cool part about it is I did this with my son. You know, uh, Josiah didn't do the actual writing, but he helped me to create the concept and the flow of the story Josiah has been acting since he was about seven mm. uh, years old. He's 15 now, so he's been acting for a while. And um, he was the lead character in the story. So even writing to production, doing that with my son, mm. you know, it felt like Will and Jaden a little bit. You know what yeah, I mean? Like just getting a chance yeah. to work with him in this unique way, in a way that we both love film. I mean, Josiah and I can talk about film films you know really like, like everything like everything from mcu to like art house films okay. josiah and i can talk about those things for hours mm -hmm. uh because we both love it and so yeah. it was just not only important to tell the story but it was also special to do it with josiah yeah i think so. even thinking about the title of the film it stays with us i think that just it just says so much um I, i've 
So I, I've obviously seen you speak um, at pulpits a couple of times, and you said a couple of things that stood out to me, mm-hmm. and I want to call them out in light of the film. So you said, quote, you know, I'm a feeler. Mm, I feel I everything. And I think it's so liberating hearing like a, you know, a Latino man, a brown man mm-hmm. say that because culture sometimes doesn't give that permission. Talk about how um, the, like the art of feeling and, and the humanity of feeling. The art of feeling, I like And that. like how that uh, helps liberate people to feel that because I feel like another thing you said too on the pulpit, which I to take my notes, mm. um, you talked about faith through the lens of imagination. Yeah. And how sometimes we're trying to box faith into like these black and white silos of either this or that when there's a mystery there that we can experience. So talk about how, I know that was a lot of questions. Talk nah, about one, how the art of feeling and how that um, liberates us even as, a, as, as men, you yeah. know what I'm saying, versus uh, shackling us and how you use your imagination to like uh, kind of unfold that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if we don't give credence to our emotions, we pretend. Because... Mm. <clears throat> The essence of who you are is not reduced to your emotion, but it involves your emotion. So if I ever feel anything, if I ever feel sad or if I feel grief or if I feel pain or hurt or betrayal or happiness or pleasure, I need to occupy a space that allows me to express that feeling, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm only encouraged to suppress it. And in doing so, Mm. I'm not true. You know what I mean? Like, I am not true if I don't express what I'm feeling. And I don't mean like, I'm going to write it on on Twitter or X or I'm going to write it. <laughs> I'm, ta- I'm not yeah, talking. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. We got to talk about no, that. Yeah. I'm not necessarily talking that kind of expression. I'm talking, where can you yeah. show up fully at any given moment? Yeah. Whether it involves grief, sadness, pain, pleasure, happiness, joy, like, where can you show up? So the art of emotions, I love the way you put that, right? The art of emotion is that you have the permission hmm. to feel all of the things that you feel with no qualification. Like, good. I, I, I've said this in the past, like, I, I think one of the, one of the areas where I think Christian, the, the Christian community needs work is in the art of emotions. We don't do emotions right well. Mm. Because if I ever go to, well, in the past, whenever I've gone to a group of Christians and said, hey, I feel sad, they would say, yeah, but joy, right? Um, Or if I were to say, hey, I I have doubts, they would say, yes, but faith. Mm. There's always a qualification, almost as if doubt and faith can't coexist. Or almost as if sadness and joy can't coexist. Like, no, no, no. They're two sides of the same yeah, emotion, sure. right? They're related to one another. So I think I find a lot of liberation when I am in relationships or among people that aren't intimidated by my feelings. That's good. That's and that good. they allow me to show up fully. And then in showing up, I can begin to observe and examine and analyze, is this feeling helping me or is it harming me? But if I don't even have the permission to show, show. it, then That's how good. could I ever discover if it's, a, if it's trying to serve me? I also think that our emotions are kind of like codes that God uses to tell mm, us things. That's good. That's good. You know what I'm saying? Like God, we, 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 uh, we over-spiritualize the way that God talks to us. We say, well, you got to read your Bible which is true. You read your Bible. That's God's word. Um, but you, you got to pray hard. You got to really concentrate. I'm like, what if I just allowed myself to feel and, and just evaluated and interrogated my feelings? Could I hear God through my feelings? And I believe you can. You Could know? I hear God through my feelings? Could I feelings? hear God through my That's feelings? Great. And I believe you can. You know, uh, Psalm 51 verse 6 says, you desire integrity in my inner self. You teach me wisdom deep within. Hmm. God wants to establish us with integrity in the inner self, which involves our thoughts yeah, yeah. and our feelings. Yeah, for sure, for and sure. he wants to teach us wisdom deep within. Okay. So I have to make room to interrogate 
what's happening inside, which inside. includes my feelings and my thoughts. Because I think what you're leading to is like those feelings being a feel, even in the film, it stays with us. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's and right. And so you're, you're kind of advocating like it stays with us, but don't keep it in, like let it out, yeah. express it and find places where and you interrogate can interrogate it. it. Interrogate it, like examine it, like say, yo, what, what, God, what are you trying to say t to me through this sadness? Hmm. What are you trying to say through me through this anger? What are you trying to say to me through this pleasure? You know, like God uses our feelings. And so I think that the art of emotion, uh, learning how to both embrace, give permission to expression and interrogating emotion actually leads you to God. And I think that uh, we, we should do that more often. I mean, I vaguely remember the second question around um imagine, this is, this imagination is yeah imagination oh gosh i mean i told my kids one time uh last year you know we were doing like family reflection and i said yo let's do an exercise together all of us my wife my kids i said let's let's describe faith without using the word faith i said let's just try to see what we mean and, you know, we said a whole bunch of things. And ultimately what, what we landed on was, okay, if I couldn't use the word faith, then the way that I would describe it is vulnerability, trust, and imagination. Hmm. All those three elements, I believe, make up what faith actually is. Hmm. If, I, if I had to describe it, I had to say, well, faith involves a level of vulnerability because you have to trust hmm. Right. You have to you have to you have to be vulnerable enough to say. Is there another way to understand my life and this life outside of my perspective? I've got to be vulnerable enough to say I may not fully get it. But then you have to trust that God does and that what he's offering you, whether it's through his word or through a word that comes from a prophet, you have to trust that that perspective is trustworthy. And then you have to That's employ good, imagination to say, what can my life look like if I believed this? Mm. So That's imagine That's good. The picture, so pictures, good. the picture's being That's painted, so y'all. Imagination is so important to faith. Oh, wow. Because I told my kids this. Uh, this was when they were very young. Uh, I said... I said to my son, actually, my daughter wasn't even born. I said to my son when he was about four, I said, yo, papi, um, draw a picture of a pig flying. And, you know, after a few moments, he was just having a hard time. He's like, ah, I can't, I, can't, I don't know what to do, papi, you know. And I said, go ahead, give it, give, give it another try. And then he came back and he drew something that looked like a pig with wings on it, essentially. And then we would later have this four-year-old conversation i said yo if i can't imagine what a pig looks like flying how could i ever imagine a world where there's no tears no pain no death mm. i said i have to employ the imagination of the kingdom to to imagine god tells me that a world is coming where there is no pain no tears no death mm. I said, I can't imagine that now because all we see Tears. is pain, tear, and death. Right. So how else could I even think of what this world is like if I don't employ divine imagination? I have to. So good. And Jesus helps me with language, both sure. in scripture and through people. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm, just sit, I'm just sitting in a moment for nah, a second. I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting. A, a sail on moment after that. Um, Hmm. Rich, I feel like you have so much inside of you and it and it shows. It genuinely shows yeah, sure. from your from your social media storytelling just on your social media and then through your films, um, through culture, through faith, like you just it just all just comes out, even with us just talking now. Um, I feel like you have a lot to even say when it even comes to those aspiring storytellers yeah. and filmmakers. Because sometimes we're so I mean this in love, please hear my heart. Sometimes it can be kind of shallow with like the faith side. Yeah. And um, I, I, <laughs> You're I mean, so nice. I mean, yeah, but, <laughs> I, but I mean that wholeheartedly. Yeah, and I yeah, feel like yeah. we have stories to tell, man. And all and all stories aren't 
uh, like you were saying, joy, happiness. Like, so, like sometimes it's grief. Sometimes it's sadness and things like that. Um, vulnerability and takes imagination and things of that nature. What what would you um, to aspiring uh, storytellers, even just storytellers in general, um, how could they tell and improve their storytelling? How could they be better filmmakers, better writers, so on and so forth? Yeah, that's really good. I mean, so much could be said. I'll say a few. The first, don't rush through, through the life that will actually give you the substance and the tools to be a good storyteller. Like, whether younger or just impatient creators will want to just go create. And, and, and there is value to going and creating for sure because there's a lot of tactile learning, right? You learn from experience in large part. Mm. But also, don't forget to live. Like, don't forget to live life. Live life because that's what's going to give you the fuel to create, you know, you mentioned uh, shallow, you know, the, the, the shallow of uh, the pieces that you may see, the shallowness of the pieces that you may see. Well, that's because people are not giving time to the thing that comes before creating, which is living. Like, you need to live. The other thing I would say is pay attention as you live. Pay attention to yourself. Look deeply within Um ask questions, do the work of mm. <clears throat> not necessarily becoming healthy because I think good art comes even as you are getting healthy. In fact, I think the best True. art comes True. from as you're getting healthy. But don't, don't short circuit the work. Do the work of self-interrogation. Do the work of emotional interrogation of yourself and of the world around you. Make time to be compassionate, make time to be empathetic. Um, because what good stories exist that don't involve human experience? But how can you get human experience if you aren't making the time to live with people and to be vigilant about how they interact with you and the world and how you interact with others and the world. And so I would say if you're a creator, filmmaker, writer, storyteller, content creator, don't forget to live. Don't forget to live because that's what's going to give you the substance and the fuel to actually create meaningful things. That's so important. Shout out man. RG with the song. No, nah, for I thought the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, yeah. Uh, Rich, thank you so much for being here, man. Oh you dropped my gosh. so many gems and you had added so much value with our conversation. Let everyone know how they can follow you and they can stay in contact with everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the best way is through social media. Rich Perez. I'll probably be the first person on that list just because there, there might not be a lot of Rich Perez's. But at Rich Perez on Instagram, um, look out in the next few weeks. My wife and I are dropping a podcast called Becoming Ourselves. And so uh, that's going to be a really dope time. So That's so dope, man. Thank you again for being here, Rich. Absolutely, man. Listen, Thank you all for letting me no, be here, man. Absolutely. This was great. We're so happy that uh, you were able to be here and share. And shout out to everyone that was tuning in. We hope that you guys got something out of this episode, left here inspired. And um, yeah, man, we're just so grateful the fact that we're able to cultivate these conversations Um for you guys to be able to enjoy. So as always, I'm Mia Evan signing off. And also, I got Ace Harris here with me as well. Listen, we'll see you guys next time here on the 116 Live here on Holy Culture Radio, Sirius XM Channel 140. We'll see you next week.